Thank you everyone for attending this event. Uh, what we're launching is the report on climate and trade uh, by a task force organized uh, by the Center for Commerce and Diplomacy at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, and the report can be viewed in the back. We have a hard copy there. Uh, we invite everyone to uh, scan the QR code for the uh, the full report online. Of course, we're trying to be conservative and not print uh, too many pieces of paper. So please do access the report online. Um, we also invite you to take a, a few mementos uh, from the center. Uh, so just a quick um, uh, a quick uh, overview of the Center for Commerce and Diplomacy. Uh, so first off, my name is Renee Bowen, Professor Renee Bowen. I'm a uh, economist, uh, and I'm jointly appointed in the Economics Department and the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego. Uh, I'm also the director of the Center for Commerce and Diplomacy, and at the Center for Commerce and Diplomacy, our aim is to advance uh, global economic cooperation. So, of course, uh, this report uh, and is very timely, given that uh, we're at a time where there's quite a collision between uh, the uh, needs for addressing climate change and trade uh, and trade policy. Uh, so just a little bit about the task force. Uh, so the task force was started earlier this month uh, and we have uh, a wonderful team from the University of California. Uh, we have Professor Jen Burney. Uh, she's an environmental sci scientist with the School of Gro Global Policy and Strategy and at the Scripps Institution of o Oceanography at UC San Diego. Uh, we also have uh, David uh, Victor as one of our advisors. Uh, we have a uh, engineering, uh, an environmental engineer, uh, Michael Davidson. Uh, we also have an environmental economist, uh, Chris Costello, and a trade economist, uh, uh, James Rausch. Uh, the code lead on the chair, uh, on the uh, task force, is uh, uh, Professor Lawrence Brose, a political scientist at the University of California, San Diego. And the co-chairs for the task force are the honorable, the most honorable Prime Minister Andrew Holness of Jamaica, as well as uh, the Dean of the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego, Carolyn Freund. Uh, so that is a quick overview of the participants of the task force. Um, and then I'll uh, just give you a little bit of rundown of this of today's uh, events. Uh, I will introduce the Honorable Minister Pernell Charles, uh, who has joined us today to give a few remarks about the perspective of developing countries and how uh, trade and trade policy uh, affects the interests of developing countries. Uh, and then we will be followed by a brief description uh, of the main highlights from the report uh, by myself and Professor Jen Burney. And then we will have a brief panel dis discussion, uh, uh, including Professor Margaret Linet, the uh, director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me give a brief inter introduction of the Honorable Minister Pernell Charles. The Honorable Minister uh, is, uh, I should say, Honorable Minister Pernell Charles Jr. He comes from quite the lineage of ministers uh, uh, in Jamaica, and his portfolio includes economic growth and job creation. It also includes uh, climate change, environment, uh, and urban um, issues. Uh, the minister is quite active, as you can tell, in uh, climate change and has been a participant here in Glasgow. Uh, I'm sure engaged in the negotiations. Uh, and as I said, there's quite a connection between climate issues and trade. And the basics uh, is that any climate issue uh, that comes up and is addressed domestically introduces price distortions and these inefficiencies must be dealt with uh, for trade policy. We'll go more into that as we uh, talk about uh, the, the actual content of the report. And so uh, I'd like to present to you Minister Pernell Charles. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Professor. 
It's certainly a pleasure to join you today. Um, it has been a marathon week. Uh, when, when I was told, you know, make sure to get sleep before COP, because you won't get any sleep while you're there. Um, I, I didn't take it seriously, but now, now I understand. But, you know, as you said, the discussions um, are even more important for us who represent small developing states. Uh, we like to call it big ocean states as well. Um, because the, the issues, the social, economic, and environmental challenges that we face um, are challenges which cause increasing marginalization, particularly because of issues which you are aware of in terms of the, the challenges. Uh, we don't benefit from economies of scale. We have small domestic markets, a heavy dependency on the external um, and remote markets, which consequentially result in high cost for energy, infrastructure, transportation, communication, and servicing in our countries. Um, and when you pair that with our growing population and the high volatility of economic growth, particularly during a pandemic, um, what you have is consequent fragile environments, natural, built, and economic. So the discussion around connecting trade uh, to the issues that are critical to our development, particularly in terms of climate action, are, are real. It's not just theoretical. Uh, you know, the, the UN recognized that in a number of reports that they have given, that improved and additional measures to more effectively address the unique and particular vulnerabilities and development needs of SIDS is essential. And so for me, uh, you know, I have had the opportunity of uh, as being associated to our prime minister who's, who sits as chair of the task force or co-chair um, and really having the opportunity to look on the report. And I must tell you, the task force on climate change and trade is, is not only timely, but it is extremely necessary. Because if we are to achieve all of the lofty ambitions and goals um, it will require us to have an accessible, a flexible, and open mechanism for us to be able to have influx of the materials and the products that are going to be necessary for us to build up that resilience. So in Jamaica, we have to build resilience. We have to do it in a sustainable way. And we have to do so within the context of a very harsh reality for us. One catastrophe, just one weather event can cause a shift of almost 30% of our GDP. I mean, in the last 20 years, what we've seen on average is impacts of more than 2% of GDP, just, just based on normal uh, weather events in our country. Um, in the last years, between 1990 to 2020, we saw, I believe, it was more than $700 billion US of damage. And when you put it in context, um, in terms of these matters, in the Caribbean, on a greater scale, we have less than 1% of the population of this world. And we account for more than 38% of the damage that's accruing from natural disasters. Now, how do you build up these, these territories? How do you do what's necessary to create the barriers and the strength and the resilience that's going to be needed uh, for us to address climate change? Well, we don't manufacture the, the, the goods and the equipment that are needed to do that. You'll have to bring them in. Um, so the necessary technical and financial support will have to now move to a precise dissection of how do we get to you the things you need to do what we say you have to do. And that's why the report on the role of trade in addressing climate change does a lot more than just exploring the linkages between trade, climate change, market mechanisms, taxes or fees on emissions, clean energy subsidies, for instance, and financing. But it goes on to effectively 
um, and timely, recommend innovative ideas and approaches on how global trade and the related policy issues will enable and support the implementation of these goals that we have, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. Uh, and it has to be done through the NDCs that we have developed. Now, if you, and, and, and I know the discussion is somewhat academic, and I'm dealing with professors and, and lecturers, so I, I'll go into it. The Paris Agreement is somewhat silent on trade. You'd agree. Um, and the reality, though, is that, as Professor Bowen has said, uh, trade has such a critical role to play in addressing climate change. And so uh, the response measures um, are things which, which re require our examination for us to see exactly how we will be able to improve and enhance the framework that countries like Jamaica put in place. Otherwise, what will happen is that we will just be simply speaking about theoretical issues that we can never reach because we can design targets, but we don't design the steps and the ladders that are needed for you to reach those targets. And trade and investment are critical to countries like Jamaica, countries like Barbados and Bahamas, some more other countries, critical for us in attaining sustainable development. And climate change is linked, as you know, to the unsustainable drivers of development. So there's, there's a lot that can be said. I know that my prime minister will be speaking to you virtually, so I don't want to go into all of the, the specific issues. And I can hear the professor telling me, your five minutes are almost up. Uh, but I do, want to, I do want to just make two more points. If we are to meet the ambitious targets that we have described in our NDCs, and Jamaica is one of the countries who, even though we are among the lowest emitters, we have taken the responsibility of updating our NDC, of setting ambitious targets, of, of reaching 28% reductions in emissions with international support, and submitting that NDC last year during a pandemic, and ensuring that we have, before we come, before we arrived here in Glasgow, we launched our implementation plan. So we are saying, listen, yes, you have more work to do in terms of mitigation, but we are taking it seriously, our, our little contribution. Because when we discuss the issues around building resilience, which requires a lot of specificity in terms of trade mechanisms, we can also say that we are playing our role um, in the global solution that is required. And, and those ambitious targets that are set um, are necessary. And it is important for us um, as practitioners to find the loopholes, look on the gaps. How are we going to close the gaps that are required for countries to practically reach these targets? That's why this is so important. That's why I'm, I'm very happy to participate in this process today. Um, and that's why I'm very proud of the work that you're doing. Because you have found uh, the, the gaps that are not even in the Paris Agreement, that haven't been identified initially. That's what academics need. That's what academia needs to do and continue to do. And I challenge you. So you've done this. I hope that when, when you're in Egypt, there's another topic that you've identified or that you've, that you've expanded the work that you're doing now. Because believe me, you know, it is going to help countries like Jamaica to not just speak about climate action, but to be able to actually uh, realize the little steps and to close the gaps and identify the loopholes that often lead us to having 26 sessions of conferences of parties without having the kind of advancement that we need. So instead of making those incremental little steps, we'll be able to, to make some, some, some larger jumps, which are required. I close by saying this. You know, 
professor will tell you that in, in Jamaica, we, we're very ambitious. It's something we call, we're little but we're talawa. It means, don't watch our size. We're going to come first. And the reality is, I want us to have that mindset when we tackle the, the concept of achieving 1.5, the race that we have towards resilience. I'm a little disappointed, I must tell you, because it's, it appears to me that for some, that's just a myth. But I know that we can achieve it if we put our minds to identifying the areas that are required, like trade, and other areas and I must tell you that for Jamaica you have to we have to achieve it because after you cross the, the barrier of 1.5 in Jamaica we start losing coral reef naturally um, our unemployment will skyrocket crime will join it in a parallel and trade will be impacted significantly because we will have to require more import, we won't be able to, to provide the necessary um, focus to build up our capacity to export to the international market. So all of these things are critical for us, and I want to just entreat you um, and, and challenge you to continue to probe the issues and to pull as many of your colleagues from sister colleges, universities, pull them into this, this necessary discussion on how we are going to move now from disidentifying trade to identifying all of those variables that are required if we are going to achieve the resilience for countries like Jamaica and tackle those barriers. So I want to say thank you to you. Um, thank you to you, Professor, and thank you to all who have contributed to this process. One love. I'd very much like to thank the minister for his remarks. I think he put everything in context uh, very much. And just one more applause. So uh, we will get our technical issues sorted out, hopefully. And so we can play the video uh, of the, um, uh, the prime minister and the other, uh, and Congressman Scott Peters from California. Uh, who's also very excited about this report and excited about the contribution of this report to policymaking in, uh, in the United States. Uh, so as the minister mentioned, uh, climate change is really everyone's problem. Uh, and the needs of developing economies is also uh, everyone's problem. And, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, so hopefully without further ado, we'll get our video up and running and Please. Good afternoon. I'm Carolyn Freund, Dean of the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego. I'd like to thank the government of Jamaica and the Center for Commerce and Diplomacy for organizing the task force and today's launch. We're here to talk about trade and climate. These two topics have a lot in common. Both require cooperation for sustainable growth. They're also deeply intertwined. Any domestic climate action that's taken will be diluted if carbon intensive goods can be easily or freely imported. That's why one of the recommendations from the report is on the need for agreement on border carbon adjustments. We also focus on the need for all countries to be involved in climate action. While advanced countries and the large emerging markets have been the main emitters, it is developing countries and especially the small island states that have been most affected by climate change. It is therefore imperative that promised resources for climate action are delivered to those countries. The School of Global Policy and Strategy stands ready to help advance discussions on climate action the research, policy recommendations, and teaching. I'm very pleased to help launch
today's report and begin these discussions. Thank you. Hello, I'm Congressman Scott Peters, and I represent San Diego, Coronado, and Poway in the United States Congress. Thank you very much for the invitation to give remarks during today's important event. Addressing the climate crisis is and should continue to be one of our top priorities in Congress. However, we know there's only so much the United States can do on its own. We have to work with our partners across the globe to address the crisis, and that's one reason why COP26 is so important. Together, we can raise our mutual climate ambition. One area where we have a real opportunity is at the nexus of climate and trade. I believe we have to create an international trade regime around our climate objectives. I reject the idea that we should weaken our environmental standards to compete in today's economy. We will remain a global economic leader by raising our ambition to provide the clean products and fuels that the world is increasingly demanding. However, as we do this, we have to ensure our missions and jobs aren't simply moving to countries with less stringent policies. This is why I was excited to see this report. I'm even more excited to learn about the leadership of the Climate and Trade Task Force and the fundamental role our constituent university, UC San Diego, has had in this process. The report's focus on border carbon adjustments, climate finance, supply chains, and international trade ins institutions has provided lawmakers in Washington and across the globe with critical insight to guide our decision-making as we move forward. And I'd like to thank you personally and recognize a few folks and organizations. First, thank you to the task force's co-chairs, Carolyn Freund, Dean of the UC San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy, and the most honorable Andrew Michael Holness, Prime Minister of Jamaica. Next, thank you and congratulations to the University of California system for their contributions to this report, including the Center for Commerce and Diplomacy at UC San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy and the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Last, I want to thank the participating scholars, stakeholders, and organizations for furthering the spirit of this effort, which is to take frontier academic work and link it to important policy debates. We need more efforts like these. Thanks very much for your important work. I look forward to continued collaboration. I was pleased to co-chair this Climate and Trade Task Force, along with Caroline Frund, Dean of the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego. The task force addresses the nexus between climate and trade policies. Trade must be part of the solution to addressing climate change and not be viewed as the problem. Against the backdrop of a very motivated global thrust to address climate change, we face three critical challenges in the absence of cooperation on international trade and investment flows. The first is that the disparate climate measures taken under the Paris Accord's nationally determined contributions could be undermined if high carbon intensity goods are produced in unregulated markets and traded freely. The second consideration is that while border adjustment measures can address excessive production and trade in these goods, they could devolve into protectionism, if not carefully calibrated to compensate for national measures. The third factor is that the historical contributions to climate change have not been proportional to its deleterious effects, implying that compensation is needed to ensure that all countries, in particular countries like Jamaica, have the necessary resources to mitigate carbon emissions and adapt to climate change. I am encouraged by this partnership between the government of Jamaica and the University of California, San Diego, in preparing this report. It is evidence of the great things that can be accomplished when countries and institutions work together. We sincerely hope that this can be a model of cooperation to shape our shared climate and economic growth destiny. I thank you. So uh, what we'll do now is just give uh, really five minutes on the report highlights, uh, and then we'll proceed to the panel discussion. Uh, so two broad things really came out of this report. Uh, as the Prime Minister has said, as well as the Honorable Minister Charles, uh, 
Fly climate finance for developing countries is really everyone's business because of trade linkages. So number one, uh, these countries really do need to access the technical capacity and the physical capacity in order to further their own climate objectives and deal with mitigation. As a second point, climate finance for adaptation is crucial. And I'll show you one of the main results in the papers, in the, the report, that tells us that climate events in uh, developing countries affect stock market returns directly in advanced economies uh, when these occur. The second main point is that climate cooperation is really impossible without trade coordination. We do have several uh, uh, policies on tables in various advanced countries, whether it's the EU uh, and the United States, that are looking at trade measures uh, to address climate needs. And that's wonderful. However, without proper coordination of domestic measures and trade measures within countries and across countries, this coordination will neither address climate objectives nor will they address economic objectives. So in the first uh, chapter of the report, Professor Harry Lee talks about climate financing adaptation in developing countries. What he finds is that average climate disasters result in 13 billion in losses in the trading partner's stock market returns. Losses occur both in the importing country and the exporting country. The source and the channel of the losses is through supply chain linkages. A very easy example, there's a large climate event, such as a typhoon in Vietnam. This, this really cripples production and results in uh, uh, forecasts of negative supply shocks that directly affect stock market returns. We also address, bo address border karma adjustments. The question we ask here is, can these BCAs help slow climate change? As I said, many measures are being put in place, both in the United States. Uh, you saw um, Congressman Scott Peters. Uh, he had a particular proposal on the table in the United States. What we found is that it was inadequate to address climate change, and he's aware of this. But what they're working to do now is to properly coordinate domestic issues with these trade policies. And we see that happening across countries. In particular, we see the US-EU uh, agreement on steel. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Jen Burney, who will talk a little bit about the other sections of the report. Thank you, and thanks for having us. It's really delightful to be here in the CARICOM Pavilion um, and with our Jamaican colleagues. It's wonderful to be an honorable member of the delegation. Uh, so the remaining two chapters of our report deal with food, um, both agriculture produced on land and food from the seas. And um, especially in uh, small islands, uh, developing states, the issue of food security is paramount, and, and I think it will resonate with everyone in here uh, when I say, right, food and climate are deeply intertwined. And perhaps the biggest question is not whether we can solve climate. I think we're all hopeful that we can do that. We're here. That's why we are present at the COPS, um, but really whether we can solve climate and end hunger at the same time. Uh, these, are, these are connected questions. Climate, of course, is making it more difficult to produce enough food, um, and yet demand is rising and still 800 billion excuse me, 800 million people go to bed hungry every night. Um, at the same time, food is a major contributor to, uh, to anthropogenic warming, uh, both through direct emissions, for example, associated with production or with um, ship emissions for fishing, um, but also through indirect land use change, most importantly. And trade is a really important mediator in this system. Two examples that we draw out in the report. One, when it comes to the main cereal crops that, that provide the bulk of the calories for, for human consumption, climate shocks around the world are really buffered by exporting stocks from, from, from major producers. 
and this is critical, critical for small island developing states. Um, when it comes to fish, fish is one of the most traded products in the world, and we sort of operate in two fishing worlds. Um, thinking about, again, our, our, our Jamaican counterparts, artisanal fisheries, but also major imports of fish from around the world. Um, and, and it's a major protein source for three and a half billion people globally. So uh, thinking about uh, trade and food is, is inescapable if we want to solve the climate problem. And unfortunately, we also show in our report that while trade um, has produced economic gains, um, in recent years, it has unfortunately been emissions inefficient. So we'd really want to advocate when thinking about food for having environmental gains from trade as well as economic gains from trade. A couple of quick examples. The recent trade war between the US and China resulted in diversion of soybean imports. China had historically been importing um, large amounts of soybeans from the US when the trade war uh, went, into, went into its, its, uh, uh, its heated moment. Uh, that diverted a lot of soybean um, imports to Brazil, which is about four or five times as emissions intensive in production. And this you know, rough back of the envelope probably resulted in 120 million tons of extra CO2 emissions per year over the course of the past four or five years. Um, we see that uh, often there's a very understandable short-term desire to subsidize fishing um, in, in fish-dependent nations. Um, and this perversely has the effect of incentivizing overfishing and pushing uh, fleets further and farther out and emitting more and driving down fish stocks. So, um, you know, these issues, again, are so deeply, deeply linked. However, in our report, I think we're hopeful for a few reasons. Um, these issues around food affect us all. They bring countries together um, because, because we are all connected and, and, uh, and we recognize food is, is a little different than other manufacturing processes. Um, and, and in some sense, the policy solutions at the outset are easier. Um, you know, end the trade war. Uh, don't subsidize, invest in more advanced technologies and research and development that can be shared globally. Um, in the longer run, marine protected areas, we know that in well-managed fisheries, subsidies then don't incentivize overfishing. And so uh, investment in these, these MPAs will be critical. And finally, um, you know, we'll need global coordination uh, in the long run on driving down uh, emissions from agricultural production on land, and in particular, finding a way to reduce land use change emissions to zero. All right. At this moment, I'm going to invite uh, my colleagues up here uh, to <laughs> take their seats. And I'm going to introduce my colleague, David Victor. Uh, David is the Center for Global Transformation Endowed Chair in Innovation and Public Policy at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego, and is the co-director of our uh, Deep Decarbonization Initiative on campus. Um, David wears many other hats, but I'll stop there. David, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. So I want to bring up here, because we've got about 20 minutes left, I want to bring up first uh, Margaret Leinen, who is Vice Chancellor for Marine Sciences at University of California at San Diego, and also the 11th director of one of the world's greatest um, oceanographic research institutions, the Scripps Institution for Oceanography. Um, and then we're going to have a panel discussion, and anyone who has any questions should be ready with the questions. So I'm just curious, Margaret, um, one of the big shifts, you've been in the middle of all this, has been to bring more attention to the oceans to all these climate change conferences. Uh, it seems like trade has been not so great for the oceans, and a great uh, ocean nation uh, like Jamaica would know that uh, because we've seen you know, a lot of overfishing, all kinds of other problems. I'm just curious as to where do you see the really interesting questions at the intersection of research on oceanographic, uh, ocean-related stresses um, and the, the climate problem? Well, you're right, David. That that uh, trade is uh, has a major impact on on the oceans, and it's partly uh, the direct uh, activity and the direct products, but it's also the transport itself. And there are 
quantifying the emissions from uh, from transport uh, is is a tough uh, business, but a couple things are are absolutely clear. One is global trade is marine trade. More than ninety percent of goods and services that that are tran- that are are transported globally are transported uh, by marine transport, and the International Maritime Organization has estimated that the emissions that the the percent of global emissions that's due to marine transport is somewhere around three or four percent. The Global Carbon Project has said it's much bigger than that, more like eight to ten percent. Uh, but even if we take the small number, that's as much as uh, a whole collection of developing nations. So as we think about uh, trade I, and and the, the the great lens that's been uh, focused on uh, trade barriers and how to uh, and trade trade policy and how to tweak that so that we um, that we try to uh, uh, make trade more efficient and uh, and stop the the uh, consequences like uh, the soybean consequence of, of uh, deforestation in Brazil. Uh, I think that we need to think a little bit about the transport itself. Are there uh, are there policies that could be attached to trade that would incentivize the the use of alternative fuels? Uh, there's been a lot, as you know, there's been a lot of development in uh, in biologically renewable fuels and then of course hydrogen is sort of the lodestar uh, and that's a that's a difficult a, a more difficult transformation to make but it's got to happen eventually you know when you mention the emissions it says, I want to bring up uh, Renee and Jen in just a moment or maybe come on up here I just want to have one more round of questions with you uh, and then open it up to, to, to the full group but when you, you mentioned the emissions question seems like this is a really tricky issue because not only are there large emissions associated with shipping, and there's some progress. Two weeks ago, I was in London for the Global Maritime Forum. There's maybe a fifth of the global shipping industry that's now doing stuff, ammonia, hydrogen, and so on. But it's still, it's a global industry. And almost all the accounting rules don't even include bunker fuels, you know, internationally, mm-hmm. uh, fuels used for international shipping. So is this, is this do you think is this is going to be a topic where we can make progress in the academic world. We can uh, uh, take up Minister Ch- uh, uh, Charles and his recommendation that we identify more loopholes and close them. We can pick up this question in the academic world and present some solutions for how to do the emissions accounting to the international community. Well, I think we have a responsibility on both sides. One is uh, shining light on these mm-hmm. issues and uh, and the, the collective scientific community together with uh, those who publicize it do a good job of that. But I think the other side is on the innovation piece. And a lot of the innovation for designing uh, these uh, lower fossil fuel uh, energy sources has come from innovation at universities. Uh, a lot of the innovation around uh, hydrogen uh, is taking place, not only at, at every aspect, the design of, of vessels, uh, that can use hydrogen ef- effectively, uh, the design of processes for making hydrogen greener. So I think on both sides, uh, uh, academia has played an important role and should. Yeah, and the, and the shameless pro- promotion department, let me just mention that we have a hydrogen ship, I think the first on the West Coast, uh, that's being designed right now for research purposes that'll be commissioned 2025 or so. Um, and this article... It's actually that- the first hydrogen-powered research vessel planet, anywhere on the planet even better than the west coast even better the than the planet. west coast uh, we have not yet colonized other planets yet um and this article that everybody's talking about in the washington post about accounting that yesterday builds yes. in part on work that we've that we've done um, at uc san diego and quotes some of our some of our colleagues i want to go now to um i want to ask a couple more questions of the panel and then if you have questions catch my eye and i'll get you on the list so first i want to go to you renee um it seems like the case for border adjustments is getting stronger. The case for doing it badly is getting easier to see. 
and I'm curious as to how we strike this balance, because I, I think everybody understands the logic for why you'd want to do a border adjustment, and everybody also understands that there are protectionists that are hard to keep at bay. So how beyond saying, you know, be nice, how, how do we actually make this happen in a, in a responsible way? Uh, great. Uh, thanks for the question, and thanks, Margaret. Uh, so very carefully and very slowly is the first uh, uh, caution I would give. Um, one of the challenges in applying the correct uh, border adjustment is uh, having the right measure of carbon intensity or uh, other emissions intensity to match uh, whatever emission intensity we have in the domestic measure. Uh, so the first issue is measurement. And this is, again, where uh, science can help us. Um, and, measurement domestically. But then once we are talking about border adjustment measures, we also have to think about measurement internationally uh, and internationally sometimes among countries that are less willing to measure. So we have to harmonize those. So that's why there's a role for international coordination on measurement, on the agreement of the pricing of emissions, and also the coordination. Uh, so we have international bodies already looking at these things and in place. So we don't need to create the wheel. Um, one of my personal feelings is the World Trade Organization is fairly well equipped to help with this sort of coordination. Um, so I'll stop there. We put the, uh, take your remarks and then go to Jen and, and ask, you wrote the chapter in this report about food and food security. And one of the findings of that is that trade often helps food security because if a country has a crop that fails, then they can trade. Um, as someone who studies food, how worried are you that all the talk about border adjustments for carbon reasons is going to spin out of control and make it harder to achieve the benefits that we've seen in trade in so many other areas? Food is one. Uh, Michael Davidson has a chapter about energy innovation. The global rev revolution in solar is, a, frankly, a trade revolution more than practically anything all along with the technological revolution. So just how much, how much are you worried about this thing spinning out of control and, and what do you advise policymakers? Yeah, I think to um, touch right where Renee left off, um, one way to be cautious, for example, about border adjustments would be to start um, – uh, with certain sectors as opposed to uniformly applying. One thing we worry about with food is that immediately applying a, a border adjustment would be incredibly regressive and would, would certainly instantly push people into poverty who are already on the margins, and that is not our objective. And so um, thinking about maybe uh, looking at the energy sector or, or subsets of the energy sector or mining and technology as sort of first places to do this, and then thinking very carefully about uh, about how to think about food, um, and, and again, being being specific, um, uh, prioritizing um, you know sort of uh, zero deforestation food might be one first step towards that, as opposed to again a blanket application. What um, just quickly on the issue of deforestation, big announcement last week. Uh, not entirely clear if it's real or it's vaporware um, or whatever the diplomatic meaning of vaporware <laughs> is. Nineteen billion dollars another global deforestation plan. How, as somebody who analyzes land use, how do we figure out, how would we know that this time is real, this time is different? Uh, that is the more than $19 billion question, yeah. Um, $19 billion uh, isn't <laughs> what it used to be. So <laughs> yeah. that's true. Inflation. That's true. Um, you know, I think we need to start seeing domestic policies aligning with this initiative, right? When you start to actually see meaningful action within one's own borders, not under the public scrutiny of the COP, um, then I think we'll know it's serious. Right. So I want to um, ask Renee a question about the interaction between trade and development, and then come back to Margaret on international cooperation on science technology. But, but on trade and development, so the introduction to the report that Lawrence Rose uh, wrote and really reflects on the report and the debates that are going on right now, it makes the point that the report also speaks to this question that's very much in the negotiations here about the $100 billion. The pledges were made going back to 2009, $100 billion of new resources. The, the West has not delivered. The United States is the biggest non-deliverer. Nobody's sure whether to believe these, these commitments. And I'm just curious, it seems like there are two debates going on in parallel. One debate is about development assistance and um, compensation. 
and the other debate is increasingly about trade and trade measures. Are the two debates connected, or are these is this like a schizophrenic uh, uh, world where they're just running completely separately? So uh, thanks for that question, because this is one of the things we take on in the report. Uh, they have in, traditionally been running separate tracks, but one of the points we make is that they are in fact linked. Uh, we make a very bold recommendation in the report that uh, when we introduce these border carbon adjustment measures, we actually use the proceeds uh, towards uh, adaptation and climate mitigation in developing countries. That's going to go a much longer way to financing uh, climate uh, adaptation mitigation. It's going to take us way beyond the 100 billion. It uh, frees up a lot of resources for uh, these developing countries. So that's one thing. The other thing is this acknowledgement that what's going on in developing countries is in fact help, uh, hurting the private sector through stock market returns. As a result, uh, private finance should now be interested in what's happening in climate mitigation and adaptation. And so this should be, uh, financing should be freed up, uh, not just through the private sector, but through multilateral agencies, whether it's the International Finance Corporation in the US uh, or, its, or other bodies. So I wanna, um, we've got maybe six minutes left. I know you have a couple of remarks at the end, uh, Renee. I wanna have time for a couple more questions. If anybody has a question from the audience, uh, let me know, but I'm going to just, so, okay, I'll come to you in just a second, sir. Uh, let me first ask you, though, uh, Margaret Leinen, um, part of this report is about international cooperation on technology. You run an institution that, that is intrinsically international, ships going around the world and so on. Um, we hear a lot of news about the growing difficulty of international cooperation in science, including between the United States and China, but not exclusively. I'm just curious as to how, from the position of being a scientist running an institution doing this, is it still kind of working okay? Or is this something that you worry about that, that even in this area where traditionally we've been able to cooperate, including across the Iron Curtain during the, during the US uh, Soviet years, that cooperation in science itself is getting harder? There's cooperation that is driven by the scientists themselves, and there's cooperation that's driven by investment by countries. The cooperation that comes from individuals wanting to work with somebody they think is doing interesting work remains. And I think that it's stronger than it has been because it, the, the nature of the problems is very interdisciplinary, and most people can't find the entire range of expertise that they want at their own institution. But the investment by nations that allows direct collaboration, i.e. you can spend the money with colleagues abroad, uh, has decreased. And uh, in the U.S., uh, it's very difficult for scientists to get funding that allows them they, they can travel to another place, but they can't uh, pay for research at their colleague's institution outside of the U.S. EU is probably the, the shining light on the hill here with its, uh, you know, its horizon uh, funding mechanisms where the funds can be spent virtually anywhere. And uh, I think that we need more of that and less, uh, you know, partisanship in the, the, the investment of the money itself. It seems to me like phase two of this task force needs to build on this question of how do we continue to reap the gains from globalization while dealing with the fact that the rules of globalization were not originally written to deal with a problem like climate change. I want to go to one question in the audience here uh, to you, sir, and I'm going to hand over my microphone, I think. First of all, thank you so very much. My name is Gilberto Morisho. Um, yeah, you know, you, know, you know the drill, right? Like the introduction, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm gonna get to the meat of it. Um, so I'm also working um, in regenerative finance and I'm doing that using cryptocurrency and crypto innovation. And obviously we all know that crypto is problematic um, when it comes to climate crisis. 
but what we're trying to do at least is we're trying to create um, natural capital assets that um, funding can come from what we actually find important, which is healthy ecosystems. Um, so the question and the challenge for everybody here today is how can we continue to use things like crypto innovation and um, natural capital asset development, for example, food forest tokens or carbon tokens to fund the climate adaptation and mitigation that we need? Is it already being done in the Caribbean? For example, we're having a living lab in Curacao. Um, it's not a member of CARICOM, but we're also in the Caribbean. But we're curious what also you all are doing on the ground. Thank you for that question. I'll take it if you don't mind, David. Um, it's a wonderful question. As we said, we think uh, just really making that link between um, stock market returns or other returns in developed countries is going to open up uh, financing opportunities in the private sector. Uh, and we, we really applaud what you're doing. Um, and we think uh, e ESG uh, financing is really going to take off as a result of our findings. I do think one of the challenges here is Bankers are here in force. I've never seen so many bankers at a COP in my life. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a thing. Um, and everyone's imagining new flows of money. And we have to figure out which of the flows are real and not. You know, when you see some folks trading on ESG derivatives, you know things have gotten kind of out of control. And um, we got to figure out which flows are real. I want to ask uh, Jen, Bernie, one quick question, and then we'll see how much time we have at the, at the end. Next COP is in Egypt. Uh, it's the Egyptians are calling it the Africa cop. Um, a lot of Africa is about development, food, food security. So I'm curious, what's your advice to the Egyptian hosts as to what they should be emphasizing with regard to food security? That's a great question. Uh, so just a couple of uh, facts, I think, to keep in mind as we look towards the next cop. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is the one region in the world where per capita land holdings uh, are declining, where yields of crops have not kept up with population growth, um, and where you know the largest fractions of populations are still engaged in agriculture as their primary uh, source of livelihood. So there really is no um, uh, separation of climate shocks and welfare uh, on the continent. Um, I would think for the Egyptian hosts, um, a key point will be to um, articulate really what adaptation means for the continent. And in some cases, adaptation might just be more development. But in other cases, adaptation is very specific. Um, we have crops, uh, croplands that'll move entirely out of their historical um, experienced climates um, within the next you know, 20 to 30 years. Uh, and that means something very different than just more money for development. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, Margaret Leinen, uh, before we go to, to Renee to close the session, what's what are there special marine aspects to hosting an Africa COP that the Egyptian hosts should be attentive to? I think that there's there's more uh, we see more climate impacts uh, around the the maritime nations of Africa that are not. Uh, being uh, supported by adaptation mm -hmm. than anywhere, uh, and that, and I include in that Bangladesh and India and low-lying countries, and I think that that's a really important piece, and it fits with your comment about adaptation in Africa. Excellent. Thank you very much. Give the floor to Renee Bowen to close our session. Thank you so much. First, I'd like to give our panel a round of applause. It was really uh, inspirational. I love that we ended on the note of Africa uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. As mo many economists have noted, it really is the next frontier of growth, uh, given its very young and burgeoning population. Uh, and we need to ensure that its growth is sustainable, that we do have the sort of climate-friendly uh, uh, energy, uh, but at the same time that we're not introducing energy poverty into these countries. Uh, so really taking into a, a serious account uh, the needs of developing economies uh, and uh, uh, small island developing states uh, is really crucial, and we hope this report sheds some light on that. Uh, I would really love to thank our hosts, the CARICOM Pavilion, and of course, thank again our Jamaican partners for this wonderful uh, uh, endeavor. Thank you so much, everyone.